If we remember back to our topic on data transmission, we said there are analog and digital data, and we want to transmit that data as either analog or digital signals. And one of the examples we used was if the digital data we want to send is zeros and ones, and if we want, want to use a digital signal, then one approach we used was if we have a bit one, send a positive voltage, a high signal. If we have a bit zero, send a negative voltage or a low signal. That's a signal encoding technique. It's how do we encode data as a signal. Another example is if we had an analog signal, if we had a bit one, we use one shape of the sine wave. If we have a bit zero, we use a different shape, maybe go down than up. That was another signal encoding technique. And that's what this topic is about. But there are a few more signal encoding techniques that we need to talk about. And then the, the trade-offs between them. To get started, we'll just give uh, a quick introduction and then start on digital data as digital signals and then later we'll look at how do we send digital data as analog signals, analog data as digital signals and analog data as analog signals. There's four combinations there. We'll just start on the first one. The signals that we generate we'd like to have some properties such as they don't use much bandwidth. The more bandwidth, the higher the cost. That they don't allow many errors. That they minimize the chance of errors. So the shape of the signal such th should be such that errors are reduced. We can have either digital or analog signals. The terminology we use, When we have analog or digital data, we say we encode that data into a digital signal. So we talk about an encoder. When we have an analog signal to send, the data is transmitted. That analog signal we say has a, is a carrier signal. It carries the data. It will have a particular frequency and we say that we put the data on the carrier signal by modulation. That's maybe best illustrated from this diagram. The top diagram shows an example when we have a digital signal. Highs and lows, maybe plus one volt for a high, minus one volt for a low. A square wave, for example. No matter the type of data, at the transmitter, we encode that data onto the square wave. So the process is called encoding. And we send the digital signal, the receiver receives it, and takes that digital signal and decodes and gets the data back. So a device that does both the encoding and decoding, we call a coder and decoder, or short, a codec. So you may have heard of the word a codec. A codec is converting our data into a digital form. And the, the decoder part does the opposite. If we have an analog signal to transmit, say a sine wave or, or a combination of sine waves, then the data, we take some input carrier signal, maybe a sine wave of a particular frequency, and we change the shape of that carrier signal depending upon the data. This process is called modulation. So we have a modulator here. We send a signal. The demodulator from the receive signal gets extracts the data out. And a device that does both is called a what? A device that does both modulation and demodulation is called a what's the name? Louder. A device that does modulation and demodulation is called what? A modem. Okay. A modem it deals with analog signals. A codec deals with digital signals, digital data. Let's go direct to some examples of digital data sent using a digital signal. We will not get much time to 
explain why there are different approaches, let's just go to show you some of the different approaches. We'll talk about the reasons later. Tell me a scheme. How do I send digital data as a digital signal? What have we used in the past? Bit one, high voltage. Bit zero, low voltage. A simple scheme. Okay. So that's the first scheme we can use. Or we could switch it. Bit one, low voltage. Bit zero, high voltage. Okay. Effectively the same. And where we, to transmit bit one, we transmit a voltage for a fixed duration. And to transmit another bit, we transmit a, uh, a voltage for the same duration. And that's duration we've mentioned as the signal element duration. But there are other schemes. So we send a series of pulses, high or low. We've seen some of that terminology. Let's go to some examples. And the examples of the schemes, the six schemes that we'll look at, and there are others, are shown here on the left. And this is an example where the data that we want to send is at the top, and the digital signal that we generate for that data for the given scheme is shown. The first one is the one that we know. Look closely, we see if we send a bit zero, send high voltage, send a bit one, low voltage. Zero, high, high, low, low, and so on. So that signal is generated from the data from that simple scheme of one bit is one voltage level, the other bit is the other voltage level. In fact, it's opposite to some of the examples we've used. We used one for high, zero for low. But it's okay. It's just switched. The voltage levels, in this case, the high must be a positive voltage, and the, the low is a negative voltage. Neither of them are zero volts. And the name NRZ means non-return to zero. The signal never returns to zero volts. It's always a positive or a negative voltage. Whether it's plus one or plus five, doesn't matter from our purpose, but it's positive and negative. So zero is in the middle, zero volts. Non-return to zero level, the L is at level, is the name of this scheme. We've seen that before. But there are others. And one which is similar is called non-return to zero invert on ones. Whenever we want a bit one to be transmitted, we change the level. Let's say the f we start at low. For bit zero, we maintain the level at low. The next bit is a one, so we switch to high. We make a transition. We invert the levels. Zero, we maintain the level. Maintain. Bit one, transition. Invert. Next bit one, invert. Three zeros, one, one. A different scheme. Invert on ones. In the last five minutes, we'll not explain the advantages and disadvantages yet. We'll do that next lecture. Let's just look at the last uh, one, one or two other examples allow you to do some quiz questions. Bipolar AMI has three levels. The rules are bit zero, zero volts in the middle. Bit one is either positive or negative, non-zero, and we alternate the level for each bit one. Bipolar alternate mark inversion that is the first bit one, it's high. The next bit one, it's low. The third bit one, it's back to high, low, and so on. Bit zero is always zero volts. Bit one is either positive or negative, and it alternates for every bit zero, a uh, bit one. Some quick examples to, to finish that. <coughs> 
I'll draw a signal, you tell me the data. And we'll start with an easy one. NRZ level. Is NRZ level, what's the data received if you receive that signal? Zero. High is zero in this case. Low is one. And we must take note of the signal element duration, so there's two ones here. That one's the easiest one. Low is one. Three zeros and a one. Let's do one with NRZ invert. That's the zero volts, so let's to be clear, this is zero voltage here. Non-return to zero, neither of them will return to zero volts. What's the data in this case? And we need an assumption. All right, I'll let you try. What's the first bit? Zero. All right. Now we'll assume in this case that think the previous bit was zero. So we maintain the level at the start. Maintaining the level means we have a bit zero. We don't change. Next one, we maintain zero. Alternate or in invert, one, same, invert, one, 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 zero. Easy. Bipolar AMI to finish. So far, what's our data? Bipolar AMI, zero volts, means a bit zero. Non-zero will be one. I didn't hear everyone. Let's finish that. Add a few more bits. This bit, zero. Next bit, what's this bit? We have an error. Why? This one was low voltage, zero volts, zero. The next one is non-zero, so it's not a zero, but it should be high voltage. We, we know the transmitter always alternates when it sends a one. But it didn't when we receive. What does it tell the receiver? Something's gone wrong. Maybe this previous one, it wasn't really zero, zero volts. There was an error in the system such that this should have been positive. 
Or maybe this one should be zero. But the receiver knows there's an error. And that's the feature of this encoding scheme that the others don't have. It has this inbuilt error detection. So that's one trade-off between different signal encoding schemes. Some schemes, if something goes wrong, the receiver can detect that. And that's a useful feature because then it can take some other action to try and correct that error. So bipolar AMI has this inbuilt error detection if we have levels at the wrong, uh, like two negative ones in a row there. Have a look at the others. <coughs> Pseudo ternary is the opposite of bipolar AMI. Bit 1, it's 0 volts. Bit 0, it alternates. That's easy. Manchester, and on the previous slide that I described, bit 0, in the middle of the bit interval, we transition from high to low. Bit 1, in the middle of the interval, we make the transition from, high, from low to high. Bit 0, high, low. Bit 1, low, high. Bit 0, high, low. So we see the signal when we use Manchester encoding. And we'll see that has other advantages compared to the previous uh, systems. So have a look at the descriptions for them on the previous slide. It describes the rules for those six. You should be able to, given the signal, find the data, or given the data, draw the signal. And I'll give you a few quiz questions just on that conversion for next quiz. And then next week we'll discuss, well, why are some better than others? What are the trade-offs between them? We'll do that next lecture. We'll stop there. Our plan in this topic is to look at the four combinations of how we can send data as signals. And because we have digital data and analog data, and we can send it as either digital signals or analog signals, we get these four different cases. We've given some examples in the last lecture about how to send digital data as digital signals. So we went through five or six schemes, or actually we went through in the lecture three schemes, and you've studied, I think, some of them in the quiz. So that's why you should have done the quiz, because you'll see some questions about the schemes in digital data as digital signals. So today I'll just summarize that. I will not go through more examples of them. If you do not understand them, then look at those quiz questions. We'll summarize and look at the trade-offs. Then we'll quickly go through digital data and analog signals, analog data and analog signals, and finish on the third one, the one that takes the longest. So we may jump through a bit. With digital signals, we send pulses. You think we send, say, a high voltage for some period of time, and then a low voltage, a pulse, which we've been calling a signal element. So we have signal elements which have some defined duration. We can talk about, and this comes from one of our earlier topics, we talk about data rate, the number of bits per second we send, but we can also talk about signaling rate, the number of signal elements per second which are transmitted. Sometimes they are the same, sometimes they're different. We'll see with our different encoding schemes. An encoding scheme is one way to try and uh, improve the reception of our data. In improve the chance that the receiver will get the data successfully with no errors. There are other ways to try and avoid errors like uh, increasing the signal strength relative to the noise or reducing the noise and so on. So there are a number of things that impact upon errors. One of them is the encoding scheme. So we're looking at some different encoding schemes and we got to an example where one can actually detect errors. This defines those common encoding schemes. There are others, but they're the ones that we see in this course. From non-return to zero level, the simplest. Low is bit one, high is bit zero. Through to some other ones, 
Bipolar AMI and pseudo ternary are almost the same, they're just like the inverse of each other. And Manchester and differential Manchester are similar as well. And the last two, which we will not spend much time on, are really extensions of bipolar AMI. Have a look at them, make sure that given some data, you can draw a signal, or given a signal, you can interpret what the data is, or you, and you can distinguish between the different schemes. This, these six schemes, specifically. So I will not go through more examples because you should see that in the quiz. Very easy once you try one or two examples. What's the difference? Why do we have multiple different schemes to send data using digital signals? Well, let's look at some of the trade-offs, the advantages and disadvantages of some of the schemes. We, we saw one advantage last lecture. We saw with bipolar AMI, if there's an error, in some cases the receiver can detect that error. That is, with bipolar AMI, for every bit one, we should transmit positive, negative, positive, negative. They must alternate. But if the receiver receives, say, two negative signals in a row, that indicates an error. Something's gone wrong. So this is what we call error detection. The receiver, through the encoding scheme, can detect if something's gone wrong. So that's a nice feature which some schemes have, others don't. Inbuilt error detection. What else? What other features do they have? Well, if you look at, for long sequences of, of bits, zeros and ones, look at the, the shapes of the signals, you can do analysis and, and see what bandwidth they occupy the spectrum of the signals when we use different encoding schemes differs. And the key point is that, maybe captured by this picture, some occupy more bandwidth than, an, than others. Before we explain the picture, normally we're, to send the same amount of data we'd like to use as small bandwidth as possible. Bandwidth is a, a, a resource that many people want to use, so uh, it has some cost involved. If I want to send uh, my, my data, then a scheme that uses a small amount of bandwidth is a good scheme. Which of these schemes use the smallest amount of bandwidth? Well, this plot gives us uh, some view where on the horizontal axis we can think that's the measure of bandwidth. It's normalized against data rate, so we can compare each of them. What we can interpret here is that Manchester and differential Manchester, the solid black line, have a larger bandwidth occupied to send the same amount of data as, say, bipolar AMI and pseudo ternary, this dashed line. You can see it's narrower compared to Manchester, slightly narrower, saying that with AMI and pseudo ternary, we use less bandwidth than Manchester encoding. And that's a good thing. Non return to zero although it starts here, is a, is, AMI is better than, than non-return to zero as well. It's hard to see, but uh, it uses more bandwidth with NRZ, slightly more. So there's differences in the amount of bandwidth they consume. So we need to select the one that achieves our goal of how much bandwidth we want to use. So that's another trade-off here. There's also some, thi also some things about uh, well, the heights of these signals. So bipolar AMI has a smaller bandwidth but requires higher signal strengths. And that sort of makes sense if you think of bipolar AMI. There are three levels needed. With bipolar AMI there are three levels needed. High, zero and low. The others just need two. So under the same conditions, we normally need to transmit at a higher signal strength to have the same separation between the levels. Think of the ones with two levels, the separation between the levels. To get the same separation in bipolar AMI, we'd need a, a higher positive and, and lower negative voltage. So 
The middle two require more power to transmit, and that's one disadvantage of them. And maybe captured by this diagram, they are higher in this plot. So there are different trade-offs in terms of the bandwidth consumed. Another feature of some of the encoding schemes. Here's a signal using NRZ level, the normal non-return to zero. What's the data? Quickly tell me the data with NRZ zero. Remember, high is bit zero, low is bit one. Zero, one, how many ones? Why seven? Well, to be precise, we need to know the exact duration here. So visually, sometimes it may be hard to see. Is it six, seven? Where does the, the seventh bit end? Well, the receiver and the transmitter must know what is the signal element duration. So let's say the duration had a number. Let's say this duration was one millisecond. What the receiver needs to do is every one millisecond it will indicate the next bit. One millisecond and so on, and that would determine how many bits. That's fine. The problem is, in practice, the receiver must have a clock that is very accurate or synchronized to the transmitter's clock. Because to count on a very small time basis, milliseconds, microseconds, the clocks in the hardware may not be accurate, such that even though the receiver thinks this is one millisecond and checks, okay, that's the first bit, the second bit, and so on, it may be slightly wrong. It may think it's one millisecond, but it's only 0 0.9 seconds of, compared to the transmitter's clock. What can happen, especially when we have a long sequence where the signal is the same level, like in this case, the receiver gets to a point where it thinks it's maybe the eighth bit, but it was only the seventh bit transmitted. Because the clocks are slightly different, then they can be out of sync. And that mainly happens when we have a scheme that allows a long sequence or a, a signal at one level for a long period of time. I think it was seven. I think you were correct when there were seven bits there. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, but in practice, that the clock may be just slightly wrong, such that it cannot accurately measure when the next bit starts, and that's a problem with non-return to zero level. If you have a long sequence of ones, the signal stays the same. Similar, if you have a long sequence of zeros, the signal stays the same, and the receiver can be out of sync. Consider, for example, bipolar AMI. If we had, what do we have? Zero followed by a long sequence of ones. With bipolar AMI, what would it be? Well, the zero is at zero volts. A long sequence of ones with bipolar AMI, we alternate. So in this case, with a long, the same data, which was 0, 1, 1, when we use the bipolar AMI encoding scheme, we don't have this problem of a signal at the same level. And therefore, there's not much of a chance that the receiver will be out of sync. Because the receiver knows every time it sees a change in the signal level, ah, Signal levels change, it must be a new bit. It must be a new bit, so we can synchronize its clock. So some schemes have that feature, some don't. Inbuilt synchronization. It's good to see the signal changing. It helps them to synchronize. <coughs> 
what if we have bipolar AMI but with a long sequence of zeros? What do we get? That is the inverse sequence, one followed by seven zeros with bipolar AMI. The one may be high. A long sequence of zeros, we get zero volts again. That's a problem. Bipolar AMI is okay when there's a long sequence of ones, but when there's a long sequence of zeros, seven zeros here, again we have this issue of the signals at the same level all the time. It's hard for the receiver to determine when is the actual ne next bit start? So it works for ones, but not zeros. So in fact, there are extensions of bipolar AMI such that when there is a long sequence of zeros, replace that sequence with a special sequence. Instead of having seven zero volt signals there, use a special sequence and We will not go through the details, that's not important for this course, but the schemes B8ZS and HDB3 do this. They take one of the previous schemes and when they have just one special case, when there's a long sequence of a particular bit, I think zeros in this case, instead of transmitting that expected sequence, it will transmit a special sequence. With Bipolar 8 zeros substitution, B8ZS, whenever there's eight zeros in a row, which would produce a signal which is always at zero volts, instead of transmitting that signal at always zero volts, it transmits a special sequence of, say, three zeros, a high, a low, zero, low, high. And note in the special sequence it has a violation of the rule. We'd expect with bipolar AMI, positive, negative, positive, negative. But this special sequence has this violation of positive, negative, negative, positive. So the transmitter uses this to indicate to the receiver, here is a violation of our rule. What it really means is I transmitted to you eight zeros, even though we see positive and negative signals here. HDB3 is slightly different. Uh, it considers sequences of three zeros. The details of how they implement it are not important. Well, the point is that there are extensions of existing schemes to try and solve this synchronization problem. So we don't get this flat signal that we always have variations every few bits. That's desirable. Let's try and finish. So you don't need to remember those two extensions. Just remember the, the point that synchronization at the receiver is an issue. And it arises when we have a signal that is maintained at one level for a long period of time. What else? Synchronization, error detection. Some schemes can detect errors, others cannot. Uh, some schemes work better when there's noise, like Manchester and differential Manchester. Bipolar AMI is not so good with noise because it has three levels. And some are more complex to implement the transmitter and receiver. And hence we can think they, they cost more to use. Especially the Manchester schemes. With the first four schemes there's a, a transition. In the worst case every signal element duration, every bit is a transition. But with Manchester encoding our transmitter must change the level in the worst case there two times per bit. So it, may, it must change in the middle and it may have to change at the start of the, the bit duration. So here in Manchester encoding, the transmitter must change the voltage faster than the others. 
and that's more complex to implement. So it results in a more complex tra transmitter and receiver. So there's a trade-off in terms of complexity. And that's all I, I think we'll say about these different encoding schemes. There's no one best encoding scheme. They're used in different applications. What applications? We jump through. That shows the B8ZS and, and compared to bipolar AMI. Used in uh, different cabling, RS232 serial cables, USB uses non-return to zero. Uh, Manchester encoding is used in wired, wired LANs. When you plug a LAN cable in, you're sending digital data via using a digital signal using Manchester encoding, Ethernet. And some long distance links use bipolar AMI and, and variants of that. So just some examples. Questions before we move on to the next two approaches. Who hasn't done the quiz? Everyone's tried the quiz once. Okay, so you should be experts at converting the data to signals and vice versa. There were five or six or four or five quiz questions. Let's then look at, we've got digital data, zeros and ones, but now we want to transmit analog signals. Not pulses, but analog signals. Think of sine waves, continuously varying signals. Remember back to our first lectures, a sine wave or the sine equation, there are three parameters. What are they? What are the three things that we can vary to change the shape of a sine wave? Amplitude, we can change the height of the sine wave, the amplitude. What else? The frequency, it can either be changing quickly or it can change slowly. So the frequency of the, the uh, sine wave and the phase. The phase is the offset of that sine wave and we've seen some cases where Right, a phase of zero, it follows that normal structure of going up and then down. A different phase means it starts by going down. So we can change those three parameters. And that's what we'll do here. When we have a bit zero, we'll transmit a sine wave or a signal with a particular, say, amplitude. If we want to transmit bit one, we'll transmit with a different amplitude. We'll change that pr parameter of amplitude. Or we can change frequency or phase. So we want to send digital data over systems that support analog signals. Like your telephone network ha carries analog signals through the, the telephone lines. Some radio or microwave systems use analog signals. The three techniques that we have available is either change the amplitude of the analog signal, change the phase, or change the frequency. And the names of these schemes, amplitude shift keying, phase shift keying, frequency shift keying. And we'll see some more complex combinations. Very easy to understand. Here's three simple examples. Here's the data, the digital data we want to send, a sequence of zeros and ones. This is just the NRZL signal of that. We can ignore that for this example. The first analog signal, we use amplitude shift keying. And the rules in this example are to transmit bit zero, set the amplitude to be zero. When you have a sine wave with amplitude of zero, it's just a flat line. When you want to transmit a bit one, set the amplitude of the sine wave to be non-zero. One or two or whatever the amplitude you want to go up to. So we get this analog signal transmitted. Bit zero, zero, the amplitude is zero, 
amplitude is non-zero, so we get a sine wave. That means it's a bit one being sent, and so on. What amplitude, zero and one, or zero and, and, and five, or one and two, well that needs to be defined, but the important point, they need to be different amplitudes. We shift the amplitude depending upon the bit. The other parameters of that sine wave, in this case, the amplitude changes but the frequency and phase stays the same. So just in this example we've got a frequency such that let's say the, the bit period is one second then in this case there are two waves in one second or a frequency of two hertz. And the phase is zero, we get just going up. Let's look at what if we change the frequency of the signal. Sorry. Frequency shift keying. The rule here is that when we have a bit zero we're going to use a low frequency and a bit one a higher frequency. The amplitude stays the same, the phase stays the same, the frequency changes. With bit zero we have this low frequency, one hertz, one hertz, bit one we get double the frequency, two hertz. What the receiver does, every time, every signal element duration it measures the frequency of the signal it received. If it's low, it must be a zero received. If it's high, it must be a one received. So by changing the frequency, we can represent the two bits. Last, we change the phase. You can see bit zero, we have the, the, the inverted sine wave here. We go down first. A non-zero phase. With bit one, we have the normal sine, sine wave, a zero phase there so we go up first. Frequency is the same in each signal element, the amplitude is the same, the phase is changing depending upon the bit. Now the basics of sending digital data as analog signals. Questions? Not so hard this one. Any questions at the back? Got the calculator out, good. The phone doing some calculations. Okay. Then let's go through one example uh, just to make it clear. It's an example of frequency shift keying. I'll draw a signal and we'll look at what bits that may represent. And just to make it easier for me, i put some scale to it. Uh, in this example I'll draw four signal elements. And for me to draw sine waves not so easy, but we'll try. to scale, we almost got there. <laughs> 
make sense when we see the, the frequencies. Just to make it clearer, because my sine wave didn't turn out so well, the signal element durations are from here to here. And here. We're using frequency shift keying in this case. That is, what we do is to send a different sequence of bits, we'll send a signal with a different frequency. The amplitude is the same in all cases. The phase is the same in all cases. It's just the frequency changing. And what I've tried to draw here is four different signal elements. There are four different shapes. And the way that I tried to draw it is that we get the four different shapes are from four different frequencies. We have a frequency, maybe this is the lowest frequency. We have one wave completed in the one signal element duration. So let's say a frequency of one. Could be one hertz, one kilohertz, but one unit. This second signal element, we repeat two times. So a frequency of two. And here I try to draw three, is that right? Three waves, and this is four. So four different frequencies represented here. Where what we do, each signal element will represent a sequence of bits. So what we need to know to work out what the data is, is what is the mapping from each signal element, there are four, to a sequence of bits, and that needs to be defined in in advance, so I'll define the mapping to say this represents 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Here I'm using two bits per signal element as opposed to one frequency, one bit, because we have four different levels, each level can represent two bits. We need to have four to represent two bits because there are four combinations. If we just had three frequencies, we could not do this. We'd have to have one bit per level. It'd be inefficient. But if we have four frequencies, we can transmit two bits per signal element. So a trivial example in this case, the data transmitted lowest frequency or frequency of one corresponds to zero, zero. For this duration, 0, 1, a frequency of 2. Here we have a frequency of 3, so we get 1, 0. Here a frequency of 4, 1, 1. And if I wanted to transmit 1, 0 next, then I'll transmit a signal with a frequency of 3 units. So depending upon the pairs of bits I want to transmit, I choose one of the four frequencies to transmit at. So we break it into pairs of bits. We have seen this concept before. We've seen that we can send multiple bits per signal element by using more than two levels. Here we have four levels. And we saw an equation that relates it to the data rate. The Nyquist equation uses the parameter m the number of levels. The more levels under the same conditions, the higher the data rate. We can send two bits per signal element as opposed to one. This is what we would call quaternary FSK or maybe simply four FSK. In this slide, it was called BFSK, binary. B for binary, two levels. Here we have four frequencies. And you can extend that. In practice, frequency shift keying is used with multiple levels, 16 FSK, th uh, 32, 256, and so on. 
So we're not restricted to just two levels. One more example. Not only are we not restricted to two levels, so we can use four or more levels for each parameter we change, amplitude, frequency or phase, we can actually also change two parameters at a time instead of just one. Let's define a different scheme where we use a combination of amplitude shift king and phase shift king. and we'll use two different amplitudes say an amplitude of one and an amplitude of two and we'll use two different phases A phase of zero phase of zero and a phase of pi 180 degrees so here's our encoding scheme we've got four levels but instead of using say four different frequencies like in the previous example we're going to change two parameters at the same time the amplitude can range between one and two so two different amplitudes and the phase can also change so with those four levels we'll map them to bits and the mapping needs to be defined and known by the transmitter and receiver let's just choose in order given that scheme, let's transmit some bits. Well, let's draw a signal and then determine what the bits are. Here's our transmitted signal. You receive this signal. There are four signal elements here, so it's split into four parts. What's the data received in this case? And it is a sine wave, as, as much as it may not look like one here. So this is the first signal element. What's the data received? Write down the data. <coughs> 
here we have a, a small amplitude. If we put values, this is an amplitude of 1, and up here is an amplitude of 2. So this signal element, the amplitude is 1, and the phase is 0. We've got the normal shape sine wave. So the bits for this signal element is 0, 0. The second signal element, we have the flipped sine wave, the different phase, and an amplitude that goes up to 2. So amplitude of 2 in a different phase gives us 1, 1. In the third signal element, we have the flip sine wave, so the, the non-zero phase, but an amplitude of 1. The bits are 1, 0. And the third one is, in fact, the same as the second, so we get 1, 1. So this is just combining two different parameters, the change of two different parameters. Amplitude shift keying combined with phase shift keying. And that's common in practice to combine those two together. Not just with two levels, but you can have more than two amplitudes and more than two phases. And the name, when you combine them together, it's called Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, QAM. That's not important to remember, but you may see it in the specs of some equipment, QAM. It's really just a combination of those two. And in practice, you may see uh, 16 QAM, so there are 16 levels, not four. 256 QAM and even larger for, for some uh, cable systems. 256 QAM means there's 256 levels combining the amplitude and phase. Any questions on shift keying? Digital data using analog signals. Where are they used? Again, there are different trade-offs between them. Maybe just finish with some examples. Amplitude shift keying is used in some optical fiber systems, some uh, low data rate applications. ASK turns out to be very inefficient. So it's only used when we need low data rates or we have a large capacity like optical fiber when efficiency is not a problem. Frequency shift keying is used in some wireless systems like UHF, VHF, radio. Uh, RFID is just a, a wireless system, say, you use to identify devices. You have a tag uh, on, a, on some object and you have a reader that will be, communicate wirelessly and, and read the tag. So it's very low data rate. Phase shift keying and phase shift keying combined with amplitude shift keying, QAM, used in your mobile phone, Wi-Fi, uh, cable modems, ADSL, and other, other systems, digital radio and, uh, and digital vid uh, TV. Let's jump to the fourth scheme. Very easy again, so we'll have a bit more time for the third one. The first two were with digital data. Now we want to look at, well, what if the data is analog? For example, voice. If someone's speaking. We just want to record that as is and send it. Well, we'll jump to sending using analog signals. And a common example that you know of is AM and FM radio. Okay, with AM and FM radio, there's analog data, someone talking or some music. And it's sent using analog signals from the, the radio station. It has a transmitting tower. And you receive it in the car, for example. So that's uh, analog data using analog signals. And we use similar concepts to the shift keying. Remember, with shift keying, we could change the analog signal. We could change the amplitude, frequency, or phase. The same 
In this case, we can change the amplitude, frequency or phase. But first, maybe the, the, some of the details here you can read through, but the, the key point is that often we'd like to transmit analog data at a frequency different from that data. And the example is that uh, our wireless <coughs> transmission system for the audio system here. When I speak, I'm producing analog data. Think of my voice as analog data. What's the typical frequencies of someone's voice, a human's voice? Can anyone rem remember? From about zero hertz up to about how many 50. hertz? More, more than 50 hertz. 100. Se not 100. Anyone else? He's going to guess forever. Re remember we had a plot in one of the earlier lectures. It goes up to about 4 kilohertz, 4,000 hertz. When people talk, the bandwidth is about 4 kilohertz. The frequencies range from uh, several hertz, or 100 hertz, up to about 4 kilohertz. So that's my analog data. But when I want to transmit it using this wireless transmitter, to transmit an analog signal from here to the receiver in the desk, I don't want to transmit at that range of frequencies. I'd like to transmit at a different range of frequencies such that it can maybe propagate much better. It will not be interfered with by the people uh, near here. We need different size antennas. So what this device does, and it was in the previous lecture but it's not written on the back. In the previous lecture I had that this transmits at a frequency of about 900, 900 kilohertz. Okay, so my voice is ranging up to about 4 kilohertz. This transmits an uh, analog signal about 900 kilohertz. So essentially we move the frequency of our analog data to a different frequency. Instead of from 0 to 4,000, it's, it's around 900,000 hertz. And that's one of the roles of uh, transmitting analog data as analog signals. And there are three things we can change. We can change the amplitude of the signal sent by this device, depending upon the data. We can change the frequency or phase. And we get AM, FM, and PM. And the two that you know of and are quite common are AM radio and FM radio. Amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. This is an illustration of AM amplitude modulation. What it shows is that in the middle is the data. Right? In this example the data is very simple, it's a sine wave. Think of that's the voice. If you measure voice or you, uh, you will see that there's variations of the signal strength over time and different frequencies. This has the same frequency for a simple example. The top signal is what we call our carrier signal. This is the signal we're going to transmit from the transmitter to the receiver. Or it's going to be based upon the carrier signal. It's not going to be exactly that. So for example, the middle signal may be, may be my voice and it would range from up to about 4 kilohertz. The carrier signal would have a frequency of about 900 kilohertz. And what we do is based upon the signal strength of the data, the height, we change the amplitude of the carrier. And the result is the, the bottom signal and that's what's actually transmitted. And you can hopefully see the shape. It's this, the, the transmitted signal, it's the same frequency as the carrier, but the amplitude of the transmitted signal is changing according to the amplitude of the input data. You can see the shape. The amplitude will be high here when we have a, a peak, a positive peak on the data. And we, when we have a negative trough here, the amplitude is low on the carrier. So this is the transmitted signal. This is the data. This is what we call the carrier signal. We modulate the data onto the carrier to get the transmitted signal. 
This is amplitude modulation. We change the amplitude of the carrier. Phase modulation, we change the phase of the carrier. It's, it's hard, a bit harder to see, but if you look close at the start, the phase is uh, non-zero. It's the phase of pi. It's going down first. And over time, the phase of this carrier signal, which is zero in the carrier, that changes. And it changes depending upon the height of the input data. That's phase modulation. And the last one, of course, is frequency modulation, used for FM radio. Looks similar to phase modulation, but we're actually changing the frequency slightly of the carrier. So maybe the carrier has a frequency of 900 kilohertz originally, but depending upon the input data, we make small changes to the carrier frequency, maybe plus or minus several hertz or kilohertz, such that we get this transmitted signal. You can see, I think, the pattern. The frequency is lower, slightly lower than the carrier when our input data is high. When the input data is low, the frequency of the transmitted signal is higher than the carrier. So the carrier frequency changes depending upon the input data. And that's AM, PM and FM. And the two that we see commonly are amplitude and frequency modulation. AM radio, FM radio. For example, with AM radio, you, or with FM radio on this slide, we have the voice or the music, which is ranging from frequency up to about 20 kilohertz music. And when it's transmitted over, say, a channel of 107.1 megahertz, that means the carrier signal is centered around 107.1 megahertz. But it varies a little bit, so plus or minus, depending upon the input data. If the, the magnitude of the input music is high or low, then that carrier signal has its frequency varied. The receiver measured, measures the received frequency to determine the original data. And that's it. That's all we want to say about the last techniques. Questions before we go to the fourth and final technique?